Matt Harmon here of Reception Perception. It is time to open up the mailbag from our RP Discord where our, listen, I'm not going to say favorite, some of our most dedicated, smartest, and intense users and subscribers send me their burning questions for the week. We got a ton to get into, a lot of topics to cover here, a ton of prospect-related questions, so let's get into it. (laughs) All right, let's waste no more time. Let's start with our first question here from Daily Trades 1997. Do you feel like Roma Dunze's coverage profile may be artificially inflated due to the fact that he played against lesser secondaries in the Pac-12 versus Marvin Harrison Jr. in the Big Ten, or even more so, Malik Neighbors in the SEC? Um, The short answer to this is not to a significant enough degree for me to really drop him in my mind, right? Like, ah, yeah, look at this. His 80% success rate versus press coverage. But if it was in the SEC, it would probably be dog shit. Like, no, not not enough for, for me to do that. And, of course, if you've seen Roma Dunze's route success rate chart, you know it's all green. This guy's a great separator. And to me, like, I didn't just sample, number one, didn't just sample all Pac-12 games for Roma Dunze. I've got the uh, Michigan State game in there. I've got the Michigan game in there. I've got the Texas game, you know, some of the biggest games of the year. And like Michigan was one of my favorite films for Roma Dunze, where he's going to go up against top cornerbacks, a top defense, and he's consistently getting separation. Like, let me tell you what, if Roma Dunze was dunking on the Pac-12, you know, uh, I've got Cal in there or Arizona, you know, any of Oregon, Oregon's a pretty good team. You know, any of those, if he's just dunking on those opponents, but then, Michigan is just blotting him out. He's not getting any separation. He's not coming out here with some of these success rates. He's not coming out here with a full green route chart or a 92nd percentile success rate versus press coverage. It doesn't work like that. And and lastly, I think we kind of got to get over this whole, like, SEC bias. Had a good conversation with Charles McDonald about this today, actually. Uh, It'll be up on the Yahoo Fantasy Football Show. Guys are transferring everywhere. There are good DBs in every conference. And let me tell you what, I'm watching all this college film right now. I'm watching Malik Neighbors go up against some of these SEC schools. There's some shitty defensive backs in the SEC as well. It's not as if like every defensive player in the SEC is good. So there are times where I I chart a guy in the SEC against a a bad school. And you could argue that those games overinflate his coverage profile to me. Competition is competition. Yeah, definitely. They're on lower levels, right? The Sky Moore profile. Um, you know, guys this year will, will be on the alert for that. The lower levels of guys that have these inflated profiles for sure. But I think we're jumping the shark a little bit when we go like, oh, the SEC guy at 80th percentile is more impressive than the, the guy at the 90th or 87th percentile uh, from the Pac-12. I think that's jumping the shark just a little bit. Although, again, I do understand why the question is asked. Well, let's move on to the next one here. This one comes in from Cam. In your opinion... Who's been the most fun rookie wide receiver to watch so far outside of the big three? Not best exactly, just most fun or exciting. Thanks for all you do. Thank you, Cam. I appreciate you. Um, Listen, this guy's not up on the site as we're recording this, but he should be on the site by the time this video is published. Ricky Pearsall from Florida. Man, I had a blast watching that guy. Number one, because I think he improved so much from his 2022 output where I'm watching Anthony Richardson. I'm like, who are these receivers and what is going on here? Um, Ricky Pearsall was awesome in the games I sampled for him. The guy that separates at all three levels, somebody that I think you could maybe line up at X receiver, but most likely flanker slot type of player. He just gets separation. He plays with fire. He plays with aggression. I love the way his, his hands are consistent. I love that about him as a player. A guy can, he can make plays out of his frame. He can uh, just get the ball to him inside his hands. And, and it's just, it's great hands, my script hands, but also a good sense of zone coverage and a good sense of man coverage as well. I had a blast watching Ricky Pearsall. All right, next one up here, Stan Boston. Since you started charting wide receivers 10 years ago, have you seen a decrease in receivers who turn out to be busts? I thought this might be a possibility as teams get better at finding the right role for players. For example, with the power slot role, Cooper Cup, I'm on Ross St. Brown have dived in. 15 years ago, these guys might have never been used correctly, and we would have not seen them in the unique roles they have today. Um, Stan, you're after my heart with this question. 
Number one, uh, we have a video either coming out of the channel or already up on the channel looking at the power slot archetype and how, yeah, those guys have found success in the NFL despite the fact that they weren't successful separators in college. There are, you're right, Sam. There are more roles available for these guys that there wouldn't have been 15 years ago. I mean, it sounds crazy to say this about Cooper Cup, who led the league in yards, catches, and touchdowns a couple of years ago. But this he's a big receiver. Like 15 years ago, some dumb team, and by the way, there are dumb teams who might have done this nowadays, seen him and been like, yeah, let's throw him out there at X because he's a big guy. We can't play him in slots. Slots for the little guys. And you might have busted out of the league at that point. Like th that role might not have worked for him to start his career. So yeah, absolutely. There, I I don't know that I'd have to look at the data in terms of nobody's you know, seen a re re decrease in receivers who turn out to be busts because there have certainly been busts, mega busts of late. You know, Jalen Rager, right? Obviously, Quentin Johnson. We'll talk about him actually a little bit later, but not trending the right direction. Um, you know, guys like Josh Doxton. There there have been some mega busts, Laquan Treadwell. So I don't know if it's been a decrease, but I think what I would say is there are more paths to success at the wide receiver position now more than there ever have been because of the coaches who are out there today and because of just the way offense has changed and honestly kind of met college football in the middle a little bit. Next one comes in from Ox Naval. I know you have Roma Dunze rated higher than Malik Neighbors in your charting, but what about for fantasy? Of course, we don't know landing spot, but who do you, do you prefer one to the other? Uh, yeah, look, to me, I, I hate to cop out here, but it does kind of depend on landing spot. Um, I could see scenarios where Roma Dunze ends up with the, let's just say with the Giants, right? Let's use the Giants as an example, because I know that's kind of everybody's like red alarm fire, right? Landing spot, okay? Hypothetically, Roma Dunze goes to the Giants. They do need an X receiver, and Roma Dunze is an X receiver. He fits that part well, but I don't know if I love a guy that is going to be a technique timing based route runner at the X receiver position with Daniel Jones. Even if Daniel Jones, like big guy, throw a ball far into tight coverage, Roma Dunze, that seems to work. But to me, I don't love that for fantasy. But like, let's say if Malik Neighbors landed with the Giants, guys running in breaking routes, you know, I think Daniel Jones can get the ball to him and he can make plays in space. So there are certainly scenarios where. I would rank Malik Neighbors higher than Roma Dunze for fantasy purposes. Right now, heading into the draft, it's too close to call uh, for me. So uh, I, I would just kind of tell you, do whatever you want there. If you have a rookie draft before the NFL draft, like you, if you like Neighbors better than Odunze, that's fine to me. But to me, they're all tier one prospects. Next one up here, we got Wookie Mistake. Rank these factors that determine a prospect's success rate, NFL or fantasy, talent, draft capital, system fit, and coaching. Um, well, a couple things here. I think we'll just stick with like NFL play. Like they're a good NFL player because for fantasy quarterback matters system definitely matters. But just from, uh, in terms of like actual NFL success, number one to me is talent. Can you play or can you not? Like if you can't play, you're not going to make it. That's number one draft capital. I'm, I'm going to kind of toss out here because really like, and a lot of the guys that do great work prospecting uh, data, you know, of course I always mention JJ Zachary. So my buddy late round prospect guide, you got to make sure you're getting that thing. In addition to your reception perception subscription, that you are getting the draft guide from JJ. Um, he talks about this, that, like draft capital can be a measure of talent because it's the NFL saying this guy's talented enough to go in the first round. So like system, talent is first, then it's system fit and coaching to me because yeah, like we talk about this all the time. And again, I'll reference that Keon Coleman video with the the power slot data. Some of these guys, they just don't fit. If the coach doesn't have the right role for them, that can really kind of throw things asunder. So talent is the most important thing. Then it's system fit and coaching for determining, I think, NFL success. Before we go any forward, got to make a little announcement here. We're doing a giveaway. When we reach 10,000 subscribers here on the YouTube channel, we've got an, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you. But it's not a, hey, we're going to give you a free reception perception subscription. We're going to give you something even cooler than that to one lucky person when we do this giveaway. So if you're not subscribed to the channel, make sure you're subscribed so you can enter the 10,000 subscriber giveaway. All right, next question here. This one comes from QSO or S0. Are you concerned about drafting traditional X receivers with the rise of cover two defenses? Should we place greater emphasis on wide receivers who can play all three positions? Uh, 
kind of a two-part question here to me. Should we place greater emphasis on wide receivers who can play all three positions? Hell yeah, absolutely you should for a variety of reasons because that's going to allow them to stay on the field. Now, that being said, the X receiver is the guy who's never leaving the field. The X receiver is the guy that even if he's able to play at X and then still play in the slot sometimes, think about Jamar Chase, uh, DJ Moore is a good example of this. Like that guy's never coming off the field. Shoot, even Gabe Davis, like we're talking way down the X receiver rankings here. That guy never left the field with Buffalo. So you had more opportunities for targets and catches and fantasy points, and all that stuff. So, uh, no, I'm, I'm not afraid of traditional X receivers. What I will say, though, I'm afraid of the traditional X, arc, X receiver archetype with bonehead coaching staff. George Pickens, great example. You mentioned it, the rise of cover two in two high shells. Matt Cannon has got his X receiver just running go routes and corner routes into that safety and, and little hitch routes. Even Deontay Johnson suffered through this at times when he was playing X with the Steelers. You're you're running right into those cover two shells, man. I mean, do we get need to have our X receivers running in breaking routes? Nico Collins in Houston, great example. Um, and that's going to transition us to our next question here uh, from GW Stull. In light of recent news, what are the implications of Diggs joining the Texans from a fantasy and real football perspective, role, usage, et cetera? Uh, look, from a real football perspective, this move rocks. Um, C.J. Stroud might have the best wide receiver trio in the league right now. Uh, you could tell me in the comments if you think there's a better receiver trio out there. You might be right. I'm just not thinking of any off the top of my head because that's a really great room. Um, if you haven't seen Diggs' reception perception profile, go check it out. I'm going to try to post a video on Diggs as well from the podcast uh, James Coe and I do sort of breaking down how he fits in perhaps a Keenan Allen type of role for this team. I think he can become a slot receiver for this team based on where he wins right now as a player. Cause again, if you've seen the reception perception profile, you know, there's a step back from a downfield separation standpoint, but Hey, the Texans pursued Keenan. Allen. The Texans pursued him as a veteran technical slot receiver. That's the area of need on this team. Because if you think about their three receiver set, you got Nico Collins at X receiver. And like, like I mentioned, his route tree as an X receiver is very different than like the George Pickens route tree. He's on a lot of those like dig routes, big in breaking routes. That guy's never leaving the field. To me, like just to be straight, of all these three players, the best film last year was Nico Collins, including Stefan Diggs. And he's never going to leave the field. Like I think he's the best Texas receiver right now. Now Diggs, I think will rotate between that flanker slot receiver role with Tank Dell. And Tank Dell's obviously got to get healthy and stay healthy coming off a major injury last year. I hate that we just yada yada injuries nowadays. I remember everybody telling me, oh, Tony Pollard broke his leg in the playoffs. It's just broken leg. It's going to be fine. And then I got Tony Pollard at the Super Bowl this past year telling me, oh, yeah, I probably wasn't really myself until week 11. So just keep that in mind when you're doing the injury optimism stuff. But I think these guys, from a role perspective, all complement each other really well. Stefan Diggs might be like, when we get into true dropback sets, and I need a guy on third down, I know he can win in isolation on the short routes, on the intermediate routes. So he fits in really well there. From a fantasy perspective, it's probably going to be a little bit of a mess, unless C.J. Stroud takes a leap to being like a top three NFL quarterback, you know, an elite guy, set and forget it, which, by the way, every bit of evidence from his rookie season said he could be that guy. So the Texans offense might just be one of the right answers in fantasy. I just wonder from an ADP perspective what that's going to look like. Next one up here from Mercury. When will Josh Downs be dynasty wide receiver one? Mercury, I'm sure you're not doing this, but I'm sure this isn't you. But I just want to say for the Josh Downs, I feel like I'm starting to get some shit for Josh Downs, which I'll show you his route chart from the in-season rookie report when his data was incredible, right? He had this incredible success rate versus man coverage. He was awesome. And, and, and I feel like people are, like, giving me shit about Josh Downs. Yo, Josh Downs is good, man. Um, and he was really productive as a rookie. He had over 700 yards, had some really nice moments. Then he got hurt, had a knee injury. And I feel, again, this definitely isn't you, Mercury, but it feels like there are people who give me some Josh Downs shade every now and again that just think like, oh yeah, Matt Harmon's reception perception is the cheat code and Josh Downs 
had a big time success rate versus man coverage, and I was going to pick him up and win all my fantasy leagues. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, Josh Downs is good at football. Okay. But there's a lot more to fantasy points than just being good at football. Like maybe not being Gardner Minshew's number two receiver. That would help. Maybe not just being a slot receiver. That would help. Look, I love uh, I love reception perception. Shock? Of course. But there's more to it than that than just accumulating fantasy points. So um, Josh Downs, good dynasty bet. I would watch Josh Downs on my dynasty team um, because I think Anthony Richardson is going to be good. And let's see what it looks like when Anthony Richardson is the quarterback. All right, last football question before we end up with some non-football questions. Dick Master 4000 asks, how will Quentin Johnson translate to Jim Harbaugh's system? Will they even have over five pass attempts a half? Well, Dick Master, loyal uh, Discord user, listen, I, I think they're going to have more than five pass attempts per half. I do think we're kind of getting to a point where we're over rating this Jim Harbaugh running effect. Um, you know, when I hear Greg Roman say, like, imagine Justin Herbert with a good run game, the Chargers were 32nd in rushing EPA last year, and the offense fell apart. Too much was on Justin Herbert's shoulder, so they do need to improve that run game. Um, and, and obviously, they will add wide receivers, but for Quinn Johnson specifically, and I want to take a look at his prospect profile, look, he's an interesting kind of what-if guy because he showed he could beat off-man coverage, but he couldn't beat zone coverage, and he couldn't beat press coverage in the college level. To me, that was a pure developmental player. Like, he was not ready to run out and play X receiver in year one in the NFL. Well, you know what he did? The Chargers foolishly had him run out and play X receiver in year one in the NFL because Mike Williams got hurt. Well, you could have seen that coming. Mike Williams is the guy who gets hurt. So, again, I think there was a scenario where Quentin Johnson could have got off to a better start to his NFL career, um, I think there's a chance. Look, it's a small chance. And like based on the reception perception data from the in-season rookie report and what's surely to be from the full season sample, he's going to be in a territory of guys we don't really want to bank on being like superstars in the league. But I do think there's a chance that he could develop into a functional flanker, like a functional outside receiver that you get yak opportunities and you hit big plays off play action. I think that's possible. Um, it's not something I'm betting on like I'm not telling you I'm gonna put a eight tweet thread about like here's why you should buy Quentin Johnson and Dynasty I'm not doing that but I'm just saying there's a path forward to him as a player there was a path forward to him as a college prospect I just think the situation he ended up with in as a rookie was obvious to see it was a bad situation for him waiting if he was gonna have to play X receiver at the NFL level all right let's get to two non-football questions before we get out of here number one Yinzer name 412. I'm a massive pavement fan and I'm constantly psyched to see the Wowie Zowie album cover over Mina Kimes' shoulder unwaveringly. If you were to rep just one album cover over your shoulder on your podcast, what is it? Well, uh, if you have seen the videos here on YouTube or, or from a Yahoo show, I've always got these three albums up here. Um, the original idea was I was going to rotate records in and out. Um, didn't end up happening because uh, listen, I'm lazy and I forget. What do you want from I'm busy charting routes. I can't be switching out albums. So the three I have up here all the time uh, is Midland, Last Resort. I got a Sturgill Simpson album. But the album that I would always have with me, no matter what, is All Your Favorite Band, All Your Favorite Bands from Dawes, which is my favorite band. This hat here, Let's Party, is a line from one of the songs. Um, I got it at one of their concerts. They're my favorite band. If I could rep just one album forever, it would be All Your Favorite Bands here, Dawes incredible songwriting, incredible music. Taylor Goldsmith, one of the best wordsmiths of this generation, you can argue in somebody else's comments. All right, last question here comes in from our buddy, Josh Scott. What would you say is your ratio for how often you are smoking slash grilling? Uh, after our move, I'm looking to get into grilling since I have more backyard space. Are we starting an RP grill channel to pair with the food channel? Uh, no, we're not starting another channel. <laughs> uh, no, no. Um, I even at this point forget to do my Instagram updates when I'm doing my smoking or my grilling. So I think the ratio is probably five to one in favor of grilling just because it's less time intensive. Um, but yeah, listen, I would endorse anybody out there that wants to get like, if you're a good person like me that was looking for a hobby, 
Um, you know, I always wanted a big green egg because uh, I used to always go over to the late great Chris Wessling's house and he would always have his big green egg out. And I was like, damn, Wes is throwing it down on that big green egg. I want to be just like like Wes. That, he, I always would tell him that too. I was so jealous. And when my wife and I moved in, my gr- then girlfriend, now wife, moved into our house in El Segundo, she got me for Christmas one year the small big green egg. I've since we moved to this house, more space, as Josh mentions, got the uh, the the large, or the, excuse me, the XL big green egg. And yeah, I'm probably doing more grilling on that than smoking. Um, again, just because uh, of the the time requirement, like, hey, I got some chicken thighs for dinner, throwing them on the big green egg. I got a skirt steak for dinner, flank steak. I'm throwing it on the, the big green egg. I'm, I'm, I'm searing it. I'm grilling it, whatever. Like I reverse sear a steak. I want to get that over the live fire. Again, you know, it's you can you don't have to get a big green egg if that's too expensive for your budget. Totally understand. But man, cooking over live fire and cooking with charcoal and, and real wood, it's the best. You can't beat it. I, I know it's like a little more like you gotta learn it, the vents, the ventilation, the whole thing. It's so much more worth it than just the 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 gas grill, in my personal opinion. So uh probably doing more grilling than smoking, but that's not for a lack of uh loving to to, to put the convector in there and then slow and low cook things, baby. It's just again the time commitment, cooking on the weeknights. Definitely more of a grilling thing. All right, that's going to do it for this episode of Reception Perception, the mailbag. This one was awesome. A uh, lot of great questions. I feel like we covered a lot of ground. Um, I probably even got a little too fired up at times. But hey, we're having fun here on the Reception Perception mailbag. If you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. Like this video. Leave a comment uh, if you disagree or if you agree with anything I said. And tell me what you want to see in the future. You know, if you want to get your question featured on Reception Perception, the mailbag, you can join the Discord, which will be linked in the show notes. You join in there, you can throw it in the mailbag channel, and we'll talk about it on a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe to the channel, subscribe to ReceptionPerception.com. Until next time, until we open up the mailbag again, I'll see y'all.